All right, everyone, welcome and good day. We're just at the 11 o'clock hour, so one more quick review. As I see, we've got some uh, new arrivals. Uh, today, we're using the Zoom webinar interface. For those of you who haven't used it before, uh, we'll be able to speak to you, but we won't be able to hear you. So as a result, the only way that we can get your questions during today's session, and this is very much your session, so be sure that you get those questions in in real time, is if you use that Q&A interface at the bottom of your screen. For some tablet users, you may see the Q&A button at the top of your screen. Click Q&A, it'll open the new window. You can toss your questions at us in real time. Um, I'll be monitoring, so I'm, I'm actually gonna apologize in advance. There'll be a few moments where I have my camera on, and you may notice me peek just off camera. That's gonna be happening because I've got a second screen where I'll be uh, monitoring so I can see both things at once. And uh, you know, I think really what we're gonna do today is uh, just go ahead and get things started so that we can make the best use of your time. And I'm very, very excited to introduce my co-presenter today, Glenn Morley, Senior Consultant with BSM Consulting. And uh, Glenn has been a, a huge supporter in this particular topic. For both of us right now, um, mergers and acquisitions uh, among the clients that we serve is a really big deal. And I felt like we've had some common questions come up that Glenn was uniquely positioned to address. So I'm gonna be asking Glenn to present in the first half. I'll present a little bit at the end. And then collectively, we're both gonna spend time today with you in Q&A. Today's session is being recorded. So uh, if uh, you wanna share today's session with colleagues after the fact, we will be sharing it within a couple of business days, usually Friday afternoon on a Wednesday webinar is when we get that out. So that being said, Glenn, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video camera and ask you to please take it away. Thanks, Ryan. It's such a pleasure to be here. And um, I'll share a little bit about myself and BSM Consulting. We are a healthcare consulting firm and we specialize in plastic surgery, dermatology, ophthalmology, ambulatory surgical centers. And it's a delight to be a part of an, an interactive webinar, especially on this topic. Um, BSM Consulting works with healthcare providers and organizations around the country. And what we have seen over um, the past several years is a trend towards some consolidation, uh, mergers, acquisitions, and um, transactions of all sorts. And so we'll be exploring today um, why that makes sense for some practices. Um, we'll talk about some of the key strategies for success, including financial strategies, organizational, operational, financial, um, et cetera. And we'll talk about what um, best practices may help practices position themselves for success as they begin thinking about mergers, as they um, become involved in mergers, and even post-merger, what that looks like and what pre-planning can do for success. So first we'll talk a little bit about why a practice might be considering a merger. And those reasons um, really run the gamut. Um, in most recent months, um, uh, March, April, May, um, those were quieter for transactions, but starting in late April and sort of ramping up since then to now where we are today, we've seen a lot of increased activity in, um, in, in mergers. And um, the primary reason uh, that we have seen is overhead expense relief, um, succession plan interest, um, the interest in gaining a competitive edge in the marketplace. And so there, there are a lot of things in play for a lot of different practices. Um, many different things can be a catalyst um, for this, including another practice potentially being interested in you. So uh, if, um, if that's your position, if you are thinking in terms of, you know, what, what can impact our valuation this course is also for you. So we're gonna talk about a few different things that can be success factors or stumbling blocks, depending upon how you look at it. Um, and the number one thing that we talk to clients about at the very beginning when um, a merger is even contemplated is are the two um, organizations aligned from the standpoint of mission, vision, and values? And what does that mean? So um, we, we see practices whose owners are in alignment, they like each other, this seems like an excellent idea to go forward, but when we drill down to what the corporation or the practice 
mission and vision looks like, sometimes those are not aligned. Um, sometimes the culture is very, very unique in one practice and um, it's very difficult for another practice to adapt to that unique culture. And then values. Values is, you know, everything that um, goes into how you, you make decisions every day, how you, um, the decisions you make around hires, around um, how you care for patients, around how you develop individuals that are part of your organization. So these are critical success factors and understanding how well um, you are aligned as an organization with another organization is absolutely critical. And so that's gonna be a first step that you should really put some time and, and um, effort into thinking about and seek out great resources for, um, you know, kind of work throughs for two different organizations to ensure that alignment exists. The second thing that I'll mention, um, and it's self-evident for some organizations, not so much for others, and I mention it because very often we will hear about problems after a merger has begun, after two organizations have attempted to merge without any external professional help, and they run into problems because there's you know, potentially a critical step that was missed. Um, it may have been step number one, are our cultures aligned? Um, but there can be a myriad reasons why um, it may be really important to seek out um, advisors as you enter into merger conversations. Those, those advisors, in my experience, certainly include a practice management consulting firm, um, attorneys, um, advisors around tax, um, compliance, um, risks, risk management and mitigation, um, account, accountants. Um, so um, don't neglect <laughs> to seek out professional advice. Um, number three on the list of things that we really encourage practices to do is great due diligence. In fact, it's impossible to do too much due diligence um, in most situations. Um, so I'm involved right now in a merger and we're really in the beginning stages of this merger. And to date, some of the due diligence that has been done includes um, on-site practice evaluations, operational assessments, um, financial assessments of both organizations, um, some of, the, um, some of the key things that you want to look at are forecasts and um, projecting what provider revenues will be after a merger, what kind of staff consolidation can occur as a part of a merger. And so a five-year forecast is very commonly included as part of the due diligence. Um, when I talk about operational assessments, and practice assessments, both parties really want to know um, both the opportunities that exist in merging, but also the risks. And uh, what we're trying to tease out when we do an operational assessment is not just those two things, but it's also what are the best practices for each and every operational um, protocol or process. And if it's too let's say it's two solo practices and we are looking at um, a single process. What, what is the best practice? Which organization does it better, if you will? And can we adapt that best practice to the larger um, organization once it's merged? And so, you know, in simplistic terms, this looks at every single step of the patient journey, every operational piece, um, all the moving parts within a practice and examining how each of the two entities performs those and um, if either is embracing a best practice, if so, can it be adapted? And if neither practice has embraced the most current up-to-date best practice, how can, we, how can we incorporate that, that higher level um, from a performance standpoint into the new organization. So no unexpected surprises because completing due diligence is just 
one of those key steps that we recommend to every client contemplating a merger. Um, number four um, is not having a post-merger plan. So uh, you just heard me sort of talk about the due diligence that we do prior to a merger. Out of that due diligence comes that plan. Um, part of the plan must involve excellent communication. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the hazards of not having excellent communication in a minute. Um, but excellent communication means that at the onset, you are creating work teams in both organizations. Um, and then for the, the newly merged organization, um, another work team. And you have a checklist. Um, we actually have a merger checklist, which I'd be more than happy to share with anyone. And, um, and having a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, you always want to have a backup plan um, and a little bit of um, a flow chart and how things should go. Ryan, do you see the mm -hmm. same thing when you are working with practices? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to take a moment and mention that um, that resource that you that you offered to share, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a PDF of that from you. And when I distribute okay. the recording to everyone and we publish that, I'll make sure to, to get that resources in, uh, included as a download for anyone who's contemplating and wants that checklist. But definitely that, that plan for what happens after, after the merger or acquisition um, is such an important step. And we see that so often overlooked. And Ryan, are you, um, are you involved pre-merger um, often with your clients when, when you have two different entities? You may be working with one and not the other. Are you, are you frequently pulled in pre-merger to uh, assess best practices for both? Yeah, we're more often pulled in, in in one of two ways. So the most common way that we engage in the, the merger and acquisition game is actually post-merger um, when there is a new imperative from the, the stakeholders, whether it's an independent investment group, the new shareholder group that's a joint group of, of physicians, um, or private equity that's backing the group, and they, they, they now really want to see significant growth. So that's the most common thing. But we've had a, a number of occasions where we've actually had to participate on either side to assist with valuations, looking at online presence um, and digital assets as a contributor to practice valuations. And that right. comes up a little bit less often, um, but uh, uh, you know, it's certainly, you, you have the opportunity to look at the advisors around you um, and leverage them to help you put those plans together. Right. Are you a part of assessment of, um, of systems to understand which practice may have a better system if there if neither is um, using a best practice and making recommendations at that point yeah and more often Glenn what we're looking at up there would be the level of sophistication in um, the lead generation apparatus so how effective are they bringing new patients in mm -hmm. and then also um, get engaged to assess what's happening in terms of communication standards and um, you know, we can see fairly significant disparities often between the merging parties uh, where there's usually one that has uh, invested more significantly in, in communications and technology uh, where they are offering SMS customer service, they maintain a contact center and uh, a you know, merging partner who perhaps is still trying to figure out how to deal with email. So <laughs> you know, understanding what that's gonna mean for those two cultures as they come together is a big part of where we focus. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting. Um, so and, um, obviously having that plan is absolutely important. And um, as I said, having what if scenarios also um, in place is critically important. Uh, number five um, is a value proposition. And this may feel self-evident to some, but um, you'd be surprised how often I have this conversation and, and it's a real aha for practices. So we all think about our value proposition and we do different workshops to tease out why we're different, how are we unique, what is special about our organization. Uh, but in, um, when we're, we're seeing two different organizations merge, um, it's an activity that can't be overlooked for a few different reasons. Um, on the other side of the merger, if we haven't done that pre-work, if we haven't thought through you know, what is the potential or what is the future anticipated value proposition 
then we are potentially not managing perceptions well for patients, for staff members, for providers that may be in our employee, um, and even at a leadership level. And so um, this, this is sort of one of those places that we want to all be singing out of the same hymn book. And it also offers opportunities to get some excitement um, because some of the opportunities from a value proposition standpoint that I've seen include for, for an organization, obviously, um, it may be better contracting with a third party payer. It may be a higher level of technology um, as, as Ryan was just discussing. It could be more locations, um, convenience for the patient. Uh, it could be a higher level of expertise um, I work with a dermatology practice right now, and they are potentially merging with a Mohs surgery practice. There's an enormous value proposition in this for both the general dermatology practice and the Mohs surgery practice, and a new provider entering the equation who offers um, pediatric dermatology adds even more of a value proposition. And, um, and so, you know, internally for the team members of that organization, it's really important um, for the team members in a general dermatology practice to understand that we are now gonna have this additional service line or two additional service lines, um, which offers enormous, you know, potential for our organization, but it also provides these additional services, um, which are patients will be able to access in a really smooth and unique way. And so that's a feel good for staff. It's a real feel good for patients um, who, who often want kind of one-stop shopping. They wanna to come to one place, they want to have trust in an organization and not have to go to several different practices um, for um, things that could potentially happen with their, their um, chosen practice. Mm -hmm. um, other value propositions that we often talk about at an ownership level include risk mitigation mm -hmm. or um, proactively managing the marketplace that you are in. And so um, back to that dermatology practice with a Mohs surgery practice, um, with all of the consolidation that is happening right now, um, it can be a potential risk for a solo dermatology practice and a solo most surgery practice. Um, it can be a risk for the, both of those organizations um, if they're in that consolidating environment and they are a solo practice. And so um, merging these two practices together in this particular um, region of the country that has more solo practices than merged um, means that they will have um, a built-in referral network. They will um, you know, have more patients um, and better contracting, better risk mitigation. They'll be able to offer staff uh, more flexibility in scheduling, um, potentially more opportunities for remote workers. Um, and you know, those, that value proposition goes on and on. Um, and um, retaining top talent can often mean something like, you know, having flex hours or being able to, to work remotely. And so utter clarity about your value proposition post-merger can be such a, um, an invaluable um, opportunity. The sixth thing that I'd like to sort of talk about and touch on is, um, the risk of losing or the difficulty in retaining top talent. And this is something that, you know, has always been a part of practice management. And um, we, um, we see great opportunity for retaining top talent during a merger if there's good communication. And Ryan mentioned that earlier. He mentioned communication, I think, three times in the short time that we were talking. And communication is what it's all about with team members when we are potentially merging two organizations. And so what does that look like? Um, we very often will see um, small groups formed and the merger task force. And it can be a merger task force in both organizations as well as a, um, you know, a united um, task force 
post-merger. And those, those task force are comprised of a representative from all areas of the organization. We um, worked with a practice not too long ago, and there was someone from the customer service department, from scheduling, clinical nurse supervisor, a physician MD, um, uh, employee, um, leaders or of the practice at an administrative level, um, accountant, attorney, practice management consultant. Um, this was a powerhouse team. But one of the most beautiful things about this task force team for this organization was great representation of all of the people um, that each one of these individuals represented. And so retaining top talent was an, an absolute focus for everyone, but we had different perspectives on what that looked like and um, what good would look like during the merger. So transparency, um, empathy, and excellent communication is a best practice that we endorse. Glenn, let me ask you a question. Oh, yes. One of the things I've noticed with among our accounts is I, I think that they're um, in larger groups that perhaps have had experience with past mergers, I, I see um, uh, a more, I think, mature or strategic approach to communication during these mm -hmm. moments. Mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly, the smaller, more intimate mergers, uh, two, two private practices coming together, three forming a group where uh, this is overlooked. And, and what I experienced recently with, with one of our, our clients was that they lost a very important member of their team Mm -hmm. um, for the lack of communication internally about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And as I was reminiscing with the doctor of the moment and what we might have learned from that, and you know, my, my advice back was simply that in the absence of information, people will invent their own stories about what's happening. So true. And mergers and acquisitions are incredibly stressful on teams. They're, nobody knows what's happening. Everybody worries about job security. And um, this person just didn't believe that they were safe in that environment and chose to leave um, to go to a place where they just simply wouldn't have to deal with the turmoil associated with the merger. What's your experience, your advice, especially for smaller groups, like private groups that are looking to come together about um, how and when uh, to start the conversation about the merger and a frequency of updates that are important, you know, that, that, that are appropriate to keep staff in the loop? Yeah, that's such a great question, Ryan. And, you know, um, the first thing that I mentioned was mission, vision, values, right? And so it, it, it's such a critical piece um, for staff retention, whether you're consider considering a merger or not. And so it, it comes into play when we are faced with some of the most difficult or challenging or complicated situations um, in the practice life. And so this is absolutely a place that I would start there um, because, you know, I, I actually talked to someone um, a couple hours ago um, in a practice and they were going through a lot. There was a lot of, um, I, I don't want to use the word turmoil because it was positive, but there was a, a lot of moving pieces for a very complicated project. And what this person said to me was, I leave work happier than when I arrived. And it really resonated for me to the point that I, you know, kind of said, time out, let's talk about this. <laughs> um, and her answer really resonated because what she was committed to was the mission. She so <laughs> believes in what this organization is all about and what they are attempting to do. She is game on, and so is every other individual in that organization. And so, you know, just by starting there and um, having passion around who you are, what you are, what you want to do, and being comfortable sharing that with the team. Um, and I see you doing this, Ryan. You are passionate about what you do, and it infuses everything that you do. And when you, when you bring a team into that passion and vision, you have trust and yeah. commitment and you've got to go into a complicated situation with trust um, and as um, Bruce Maller you know Bruce who started BSM consulting he talks about having a tall stack of chips and if you've done a great job and you have a lot of chips then when times get tough 
and you have to cash in a couple of chips, it's still okay because you've got a tall stack of chips with your employees or with an individual you're working with and those chips are trust. And so I don't know if that answers your question around cadence of communication, that's gonna change um, or be different for every organization. I can give you examples of what that has looked like in successful communication. Um, I work with a, um, with a solo practice, as you said, that can be a challenging environment for communication or not. Um, this particular organization has been very transparent around interest in merging, but not why they are interested in merging. And that's, that's um, because the why is something that could be unsettling for the employee team. Um, and it's not a bad thing, but it's the timing of communicating that is going to be strategic yeah. uh, because yeah. it's, 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 you know, there's no, it, it's, there's no reason to cause any upset when mm -hmm. that reason can be given and the solution given at the same time. It's a, it's a, you know, um, a happy ending, no matter how you look at it, but they are being very transparent everywhere they can in the most important things that will impact the employees. And um, the cadence of that um, aligns with the cadence of their typical communication. It ramped up a little bit um, as the merger um, you know, task force were formed. Um, and then the communication was you know, very, very frequent during a merger. And then post-merger, it stays pretty intense communicating um, and helping teams learn better and different communication post-merger. That's a whole different area that can be a standalone webinar. Excellent, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, number seven, um, and this is, this is something that I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with, um, is having a sacred cow or a unique process that um, is really um, difficult to shift. During a merger, um, it, it's important in the front end, you know, when we're exploring culture, we're in exploring operations, to not just understand what those differences are, but if we identify differences, to understand how adaptable each team will be to change. Um, and pointing out the, the areas that we're alike um, is really important and minimizing the places that were different can be important. So the more that we can do that, the better. Um, it is, um, I, I always think in terms of change being something that I would like a team to come to um, on their own. And so we may, we may know the change that we'd like to see happen, um, but starting with why can be very helpful to help individuals or organizations actually implement change um, and guiding people towards the right decision about change uh, means that sometimes it can become their idea and that uh, flexibility and adaptability becomes um, a lot easier. So having at the end of the day, two merge practices need to embrace one common way of doing things from an operational level, from a patient management um, standpoint from a branding and brand articulation standpoint um, and learning who you are as an entity um, and understanding all of those value propositions that you will have as a merged entity means that um, we're able to communicate those effectively um, to patients, um, among teams and, um, and be successful both during the merger and post-merger. So let's talk just a second about why, why man mergers aren't sometimes as successful, um, starting with a cultural fit, um, lack of leadership, and um, you know, from the standpoint of, of um, brand articulation and value proposition, all of those have to, we have to be on the same page at the highest leadership level um, and then, you know, all the way down um, the food chain in the larger organization. Um, if there's not alignment, then we're going we're gonna to have some problems. Um, too much 
focus on the valuation and not as as much needed focus sometimes on some of these other things we're talking about. Um, not focusing on key operational considerations can be a huge stumbling block and we talked about that as well as lack of communication. Um, and then the last that we haven't really talked about is inaccurate or unrealistic revenue or expense projections in the pro forma. And these can um, be mitigated um, by additional due diligence, testing the theory, understanding market dynamics. Um, so none of these stumbling blocks are things that can't be overcome with good planning and um, and um, uh, focused um, intention. Um, so some of the best practices for successful mergers are alignment in these areas. And um, I would um, challenge anyone that is considering a merger to go through the checklist that we'll provide and identify areas, do a, a sort of self-evaluation, if you will, to understand where your weaknesses and threats and opportunities um, and strengths are. A SWOT analysis can be very helpful as you contemplate um, a merger. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of, of this um, webinar with you, Ryan. It's been such a pleasure, and um, I believe we'll have some Q&A at the end. Absolutely, and I'm gonna switch over there and uh, get uh, my slide up on the screen for us to share. Pardon me while I do exactly that. Uh, Glenn, go ahead and uh, disable the sharing on your side. While we're doing that transition, for everybody that's uh, on the call with us today in uh, the live session, what I want to invite you to do is, um, if you had the questions that, that came to mind as you're watching Glenn's presentation, just to remember to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. You might see me glance off to the side uh, as we're doing this next section here, and we'll um, be referencing my second monitor where I'm gonna see your Q&A. So we make sure we get those, those questions answered before we wrap up today. Um, I'm going to, as, as Glenn and I talked about just in the beginning a little bit, I'm going to focus on the other side of that merger acquisition where uh, Interactive more often gets involved. Very often when we're brought in after a small group is formed or a large group has established some uh, really ambitious revenue goals and is looking to reach and acquire new patients into the practice. And so <clears throat> really what we're going to be looking at are the challenges, really four specific operational challenges that we've experienced firsthand with the, the large and mid-sized groups that we serve. Um, you know, just a tiny bit about myself. I've been involved in uh, marketing for the medical industry for about 23 years now. Uh, I've had Aetna for just over 18. Got a great group of people that are based out here in California, but we work with clients all over North America, and we pretty much do all things online marketing. Now, um, the first challenge, and I think this is the thing to ask yourself is, are you not in control of all of your local listings and social profiles uh, if you're in that post-merger environment? And um, while we see this, uh, I think with probably every new group client that we onboard, uh, I'm forced to think about a, a, one of our, our newest clients that's joined us. They have about a half dozen locations, but just over 200 providers. And they had actually had a series of mergers over uh, the last five years. And um, as we were bringing them on board, our due diligence, our assessment actually discovered that uh, the oldest brand that was acquired that hadn't existed for five years still had an extensive online presence with uh, active listings on Yelp, a Google My Business listing that conflicted with the new branded listing, um, that they didn't have control of the online rating and review sites for the majority of their providers. So all of those health grades and rate MDs and vital listings for over 200 different providers were out there often receiving critical feedback from patients and they had no way to engage in that dialogue or even really be able to become aware as that, those, uh, those, re those uh, reviews were appearing. You know, and we have to acknowledge today that you know, the yellow pages are, uh, you know, they've gone the way of the dinosaur. They're largely extinct, although they still get delivered. They more often than not end up in the recycling bin. And that today, local results and then as well, those social profiles, they dominate search results, right? And, and we know that the majority of, of North Americans are turning to the internet first to guide their healthcare decisions. So what you need to know if you're maybe in that post-merger environment and you're not sure, and if you're not sure, you can ask the question this way. You can go to your marketing leadership or to your agency partner and ask, 
do we have a record of all of the places where our businesses and our providers appear online and the credentials to access and control those listings? And if the answer is no, a couple things you need to appreciate. In, it's completely normal in those group profile, uh, group environments, profiles do tend to proliferate, especially if there's been brand transitions over the year or movements of providers in and out of the practice. But that inconsistency, um, unreliable naming conventions, uh, uh, a lack of a clear brand reference across your location, all of those things directly impact how and how often you're going to show up in local search and can actually reduce your market opportunity. It will keep you hidden. Inconsistencies can keep you hidden from patients actually finding you when you want to attract new business. And um, it's a difficult thing, I think, for some, some business leaders to accept, but today, patients may more often learn information about your clinics on properties that you can't directly control. So they, they're less and less often actually making it to your website and they're getting things like your phone numbers, your hour of operation, which providers and procedures are available at which locations from sites like Google or Yelp. So how do you get control of these things? Well, ultimately you need to catalog all of those existing profiles that are out there and make sure that you have the credentials to access and control them. When you do that assessment, you're likely to find that you have a disparity of, of ways that you talk about your business. And you need to decide at a leadership level, what do you expect your marketing team or the agency that you hire to control? Some large groups will say, we're really only gonna focus on our locations, right? The, the physical presence, because it's just too much work to try to keep our hands around all of the listings that are out there on the internet about your providers, and that's okay. Others will say, no, no, we need to have a better handle on our brand and what's being said about our providers, so we need to capture all of those things. And deciding what that strategy is, how much you expect of your team is gonna be important so that they can do it well and be successful. Then we wanna leverage, whether it's an internal team or the agency, to go through what can be a very arduous process of regaining control. Often we find that there are listings that were set up a, a decade ago. They were uh, established by a nurse or a practice manager and nobody has any more the login and password that's required to get in there and update the address or the phone number of your hours of operation. And as a result, those li listings are left to languish. Now there are processes in place to recover access to those things. And you just need to make sure that everybody knows that it's an expectation that you are going to control your listings. So the second thing we have to think about here, and it's a question you need to ask yourself, is are you overlooking online channels for crisis communications? You think, ah, oh, what possible means can I have for crisis communications? Well, COVID's a great example, but this actually first came up for us uh, a number of years back. We had a, a large multi-specialty surgical group that we worked with in the Northeast. And as many of you on the call will know from the Northeast, snow days are a real thing. They happen every couple of years. And the process of, um, especially for groups that may run a contact center where some locations are closed and others are open and need to continue normal business operations, but all communications are handled inside of a contact center, it can be debilitating for a, a, a larger group, especially a multi-region or multi-state group, to get clear messaging out about what's happening at one or more locations when you don't actually have either that control or the plan. So a couple things that you need to know. Critical events, we've seen this firsthand. I know it's a real thing. They can completely overwhelm a contact center if that's how you're going to run communications. And it can take and it can exacerbate a problem. Where if just a select number of offices are dealing with a crisis or they're dealing with it in a certain way, that event can actually prevent normal operations and seriously disrupt revenue in the rest of the network. So it's important that you know um, and you have an infrastructure in place to support that. And that simple things like adjustments to hours, alerts, right? during COVID, how important was this? That they either need to be broadcast um, not just on your local profiles, like your Google My Business listing. It's often the first place people are gonna go. I'm sure everybody on the call has done this during COVID. Check to see, is my hairdresser open yet, right? Um, like that vehicle, that medium is important today social media, that we need to have a plan that gets messaging out there, and either location-specific alerts on the location pages of your website or a global alert if this is a crisis that's affecting the whole of your network. 
So how do you master the situation? What, what projects could you take on to do better at this the next time this comes up? You know, hopefully we don't have a situation where we're looking at a resurgence as we get into the fall of the COVID and that in select markets, we might see rollback, but it is a real possibility. So now is the time to take control of this. So document the protocol, right? Give, give your team a plan for success, something that they can fall back on because in the midst of the crisis, this can actually be a, a real lifesaver. Um, in addition to that, you can deploy enhancements now that empower your team to quickly broadcast those location, uh, those updates on individual location pages or site-wide um, without the need necessarily to interface with a, a web developer or a support team so that you can more uh, efficiently and more quickly get important notices out to the public. So the third of the four things that I want to challenge you to think about today is, are you leaving online reputation specifically to sort of take care of itself. Now, the thing I want to acknowledge in the midst of joining practices together or even just running day to day a really large group, um, taking time or energy to focus on reputation uh, can seem like a distraction, right? It can seem like a, uh, a want rather than a need to do. And the couple things I really need for leaders in group practices to understand is that reputation today, especially in the medical space, is more important than it's ever been, and it is one of the major drivers for your long-term success. So what we know, dating back as far as this report that was published in uh, early 2018, based on data that came out of 2017, is that doctors were already third in review popularity after only dining establishment and hotels, right? So we, we were trained originally, we became accustomed to reviews in um, the travel and leisure space, but very quickly they become central to the way that we approach healthcare decisions. And I'm, I'm forced to think about, you know, Glenn talked a moment ago about due diligence, um, and I'm forced to think about a, uh, a large group that we worked with uh, that, um, whose diligence prior to us working together did not include examining the online reputations of the clinics that they were acquiring. And what we saw as we looked at their performance data for the previous two years, that the, there was a direct correlation between those clinics who were financially underperforming and those clinics who came to the group with a bad online reputation. Because what many leaders need to understand is simply changing your brand. If the clinic is staying at the same address, it is very difficult to run away from a history of bad online reviews. Most of the major online review portals, the Yelps, the Googles of the world, will transfer the business reviews onto a new brand as long as there's continuity uh, of the same service category at the same location. Right? And so reviews like this, they're never answering, they're never communicating. I made my appointment, but when I got there, they never told me that they stopped accepting my insurance. Or worse, a review like this that says, I haven't even been into the office. And I'd recommend you don't go there because my customer service experience was so bad. And this is very much in keeping with a series of um, studies that we did. We looked across a couple different industries. This is actually the, the specific chart for ophthalmology. The data is slightly different, but the order is exactly the same. We found in dermatology and in plastic surgery uh, was that negative reviews most often were about common service concerns. Um, uh, poor communication, poor attitude, time management issues, feeling rushed in a consultation or being forced to wait too long, and things like the outcome, things like the cost or the value of the services very, very rarely were coming up. And what we know from studies more recently is that about 60% of healthcare decisions, and this is US data, I know we've got some Canadians on the call with us today, about 60% of healthcare decisions are directly linked to online reviews. So this stuff we know matters. So what you need to know is that right now, reviews that are deposited specifically on Google are gonna offer the greatest benefit for your clinic because um, those reviews, especially when they're positive reviews, are going to directly influence your visibility in Google local search, those map search results, which for many of our clients today can account for 54% or more of all of the reviews coming from Google, or the traffic coming from Google back to their site. Now, um, how good do you need to be? Well, the good news is you only need, uh, maybe this is bad news for some of you, but you only need to be four stars or better for each location and physician. 
Um, you don't need to be perfect. Uh, consumers have, I think, fairly realistic expectations in some cases. Now, they do value consumers' recency of reviews above all else. So this means that you have to have a program that encourages patients to continually deposit new reviews um, because old reviews aren't seen as very trustworthy by patients who are about to have a new experience with your clinics. So uh, among those people that are actually re reading reviews, what's important to note is that 97% of those, um, that cohort are actually taking the time to study how an office replies. Many of you, especially here in the United States where you have to be concerned about HIPAA are gonna wait, raise a hand and say, wait, wait, Ryan, I can't reply because of HIPAA. That's not true. There are safe ways to reply um, in a HIPAA compliant manner. You just have to be very mindful about how you engage in the public space. Um, but what's, I think, probably most salient in this is that you need to know that today, especially in a large group environment where scalability is a concern, that the majority of businesses are actually using software automation to help prompt patients to deposit those reviews. So if you're focused on, if you really want to try to take control of your online reputation for your physicians and your larger group brand, um, you really need to focus on training for and closely monitoring specifically phone and messaging skills. I know today it's not just phone, people are communicating by email, they're communicating by SMS, they're in chat applications. You need to make sure that those skills are developed, monitored, and continuously improved. Um, wait times and uh, rushed appointments, those are going to cause you to receive, no matter what you do, you're going to get negative reviews if that's a part of your operations. So striving to overcome that is going to be important. Um, managing expectations is another thing that was a smaller contributor in our study. Patients who didn't know what was next or didn't understand what aspects of the recovery would be like for certain surgical procedures. Those were in fact regular drivers for complaints online. Um, you need some kind of software in place that's ultimately going to um, automate the monitoring and alert you when new reviews come up so that you can address situations head on. Uh, and there's as well software today that you should be considering or deploying that will automate the ask. Um, we have seen that when the review request goes out in SMS, you're more likely to get a review, depo review deposited than when it goes out, for example, in email. And then you've got some clear protocols in place to escalate patient concerns when they are um, appearing online and where you can see specific trends at the level of individual locations. Because in groups, different offices obviously are going to have different reputation profiles online. Now, the last question here, and then we'll move to that Q&A section, is about missing any opportunities for automation. Right, so um, in large groups, I think very often, as Glenn pointed out, what we're thinking about here is we're joining together for often some kind of economy of scale. And what we very often experience, especially with the largest groups that we serve, those groups that are over 20 locations, we have groups that, um, that approach or exceed 100 different office locations, is that you can end up with a kind of patchwork and a patchwork that makes patient experiences very difficult. So what I think you need to understand, and I'll think of actually right now a location that we serve in the Northeast. Um, they brought together a, a large group of practices and each one had different practice management software, a different set of procedures that they offered because they had different devices and technology. They had different providers at different offices at different times. And because their procedures were different, different offices wanted to run different promotions inside of the same month but most notably is their pair mix was a, a mess. And um, they are still today working on normalizing pair mix, which is incredibly difficult because they cross state lines. And when we studied the calls coming into the call center, what we found is actually 60% of all the calls coming in were asking, where do you accept my insurance? And so in their particular case, we were able to um, automate away the majority of those calls by developing marketing automation software that lets patients sell service, that lets them look up which payers are available at which office locations so they can pick where to go. So what you need to know if you're operating in any patchwork like that, first and foremost is that those inter-office differences, the providers, your procedures, your payers, your promotions, they're gonna be a major source of inquiry coming in. And if you're operating a contact center where the main thing that you want your operators doing is booking new appointments, but the reality is that the majority of your labor cost is going into answering questions about uh, which offices are supporting the fall LASIK promotion or which offices accept my insurance, then you're wasting a lot of money that doesn't need to go that way. But more importantly, it can drive complaints. 
Because if your call center operations are scaled to the number of appointments you need to book, but that you're wasting a significant amount of time on other ancillary concerns that patients should be able to answer online for themselves, it's gonna drive wait times, poor communications, which will translate into complaints on those online rating sites. What we find that's important for, uh, I think, business leaders to understand is there's great data out there. It's actually Harvard Business Review published this, published this one, that 81% of consumers would prefer to actually try to self-service, to solve their own problems, rather than contacting a live representative if we give them the tools. So the challenge for you as a large group is to decide, well, where can I turn automation to my advantage? So a great way to identify this is audit both your inquiries, you know, listen to recorded calls in the call center, um, use any software that you have available to track what was the primary uh, reason for uh, uh, inquiries that were coming in, or look at your feedback forms that are coming in to identify those areas where self-service is really gonna help your business to soar. And then deploy those automations that are going to save you time, save you significant cost, and ultimately improve patient experience. And it's gonna feed right back into that loop with those online reviews that we talked about in your reputation um, to make that better. Now, Glenn and I, between us, I think we talked about 11 different areas where you might need to focus before and after the merger. Glenn, if you want to come back in here and uh, we'll remind the audience that um, a couple of things. Number one, use that Q&A box if you'd like to pass us a couple of questions. We'll be sure to get those answered before we wrap up here in just the next couple of minutes. But I want to remind everyone that, um, and Glenn, I'm not sure what your experience is with this, but uh, in most cases when I'm looking at group practices, uh, my my perception is that they're understaffed for the scale of the challenges very often that they need to overcome. And that the pursuit of operational efficiency very often means that um, you know, members of the team have even more on their back that they need to address. So today, uh, you, know, you might look to focus on taking on one or two things away, not all 11, so don't feel overwhelmed, but one or two things that you think are really operational imperatives that you can um, that you can tackle successfully. So um, for my part, if you want a copy of the, the presentation deck, you can email me directly. Um, if you're interested in our newsletter, you can go to that address there. But let's, let's just close out by taking a couple of questions. And Glenn, first, first question that's coming in um, is about due diligence. In your experience, what is most often missed or overlooked when um, practices, whether they're either doing it themselves or um, they've, they've brought somebody in. What have you seen that gets overlooked in that due diligence phase? I think it, it, it typically is in the operational realm. And it, so it may be um, revenue cycle management, how rev, revenue cycle management, um, what that process um, looks like in one practice versus the other. And um, you pointed out, a, you know, all of those different practices. It had a different way of doing things. Um, but... Um, I would say operations is typically where en enough due diligence um, was not done in advance. And then post-merger, there's a little bit of a scramble to um, figure out how we can create those consistencies. Good. And this is a, this is a question I think all, it's a, a fairly tactical question. I'll take with this mm -hmm. one. Um, how, how do you manage promotions at individual locations for large multi-location groups? Um, so to answer your question back, there's a, a variety of different things that we do on the website level. Um, we build the site in such a way where uh, promotions can link to one or more of the practice locations so that we can display um, location-specific deals or offers. I think this most often comes up with our, our aesthetic clinics, dermatology, um, and um, uh, a plastic surgery practices, although we've seen this a little bit with our large ophthalmology groups that don't have, offer LASIK at every one of their offices, um, and LASIK is prone more often to seasonal promotion, but where we can display a, um, a promotion on a centralized promotion page that lists where it can be redeemed, and then each one of the associated locations get that same promotion, autom uh, promotion automatically featured on its profile page. Um, we can then take that information and go out to local profiles like Google My Business and actually posts, uh, put posts there on those listings that advertise that promotion at those individual locations. Um, there's more that we can do there, but it's largely focused on clear communication um, on the website and then things like segmented email lists or specifically geographically targeted social media advertising. So it's definitely doable um, if you're in a place where you 
you're, you're not making the same offer at every location and every time. Um, Glenn, another question that's mm -hmm. coming in is looking specifically at challenging conversations about um, potential team consolidations. When's the mm -hmm. right time? So I think mm -hmm. if I interpret this question correctly, what they're asking is, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's, a, there's a moment in time where you have to reveal to the world um, mm -hmm. that a merger is happening because you're going to start to see people in the office doing due diligence. You're, right. um, you, you're going to have to start that communication. And then um, I would imagine very often there's, there's a time gap between that and when uh, the staff uh, configuration begins to change. Right. You know, I've seen the mistake make, oh, everybody's going to keep their job. And then there's a huge trust loss when mm -hmm. that doesn't actually happen. Right. But what's your advice for practices that are trying to retain talent during the transition period mm -hmm. um, about that? It's a really difficult communication topic. Yeah, it can be. Um, and um, but it doesn't always have to be. So, you know, the transparency that we both have talked about and involvement, um, the more we can involve uh, key individuals for a department, for um, a division, however you know large the organization is, but having a representative, if it's a large group, um, let's say of managers, um, a manager representative, if you're merging lots of locations, so that the, uh, the managers can understand, does this mean that I'll be managing multiple locations now and not one, um, and, and begin to answer some of the most pressing questions. Um, and so, you know, understanding what those questions are means that we are, we're asking the right questions and, and then we're asking the question behind the question. And so it takes time, uh, it takes focus, it takes a lot of empathy, um, but we've become pretty good at it through COVID, having difficult conversations and, um, you know, dialing up empathy and meeting people where they are. And at the end of the day, um, if we've done a great job in, you know, bringing them in as part of our mission and then, you know, getting investment in the new mission, then there's increased trust. So that's what we're always looking for is trust and, and deserving that trust, um, earning that trust. Um, so that we can manage through together. Excellent. Glenn, well, we have to myself uh, and my entire team. I want to be sure to thank you and everybody at BSM for making your time available for, uh, for the webinar today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that uh, this session has been recorded, so if you want to play it back or share it with any colleagues, you're free to do so. Um, it'll take just a couple of days. We'll get that out on Friday, and I think Glenn has been gener generous enough to offer a checklist up. We'll include that checklist in the, the post so you can download that as well. Glenn, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm thank you so much. We love partnering with you, Ryan. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Good day, everyone. Take care and enjoy the rest of the week.